A 10,000 pound Hummer EV cruising at 60 miles an hour will take over 200 feet to come to a stop during a panic brake scenario. My CBR that weighs 20 times less will stop from that same speed in half of that distance, and my car will stop from 60, as tested, somewhere in the middle in less than 150 feet, which is more than acceptable as far as road cars are concerned. But what if we go faster? What if we're going 200 instead of 60? How quickly can you stop when you're covering the length of Millennium Force's lift hill every single second? When you're going faster than the BB from this BB gun? A lot of cars can go 200 miles an hour, but it isn't all about top speed and acceleration like every EV manufacturer wants you to believe. It's also about how quickly you can stop. And no car on Earth can stop as fast as a Formula 1 car can. In the same amount of time that it took for me to go from 60 miles an hour to a standstill, a Formula 1 car will have gone from 220 miles an hour to halfway through the chicane. These cars can go from over 200 to a standstill in less than four seconds, and it is, since I became a fan of the sport, my favorite thing about the cars. Watching them go into a braking zone looks like a glitch. If I ever can make it to a Formula 1 race in person, I'm going to the hardest braking zone that I can find. And don't get me wrong, watching a car pull 700 Gs taking a corner at 180 miles an hour is incredible for its own reasons. But when you see clips like this, it almost breaks your brain. This is a clip that I found on Reddit of a Formula 1 car going into turn 1 at Monza. The car in this video is going over 220 miles an hour before the driver hits the brakes, and he's already turning into the corner in less time than it took for me to stop from 60. How is this possible? First, we need to understand how the brakes work in a Formula 1 car. Similar to the brakes on your road car, the brakes on a Formula 1 car work on all four wheels, with usually about 55% of the braking being sent to the front wheels and 45% being sent to the rear. And when the driver pushes the incredibly firm brake pedal, it compresses two master cylinders. One is for the front brakes, and one is for the rear brakes. These master cylinders cause hydraulic fluid to be pushed to the brake calipers on all four wheels. This hydraulic fluid pushes a set of pistons inside of the brake calipers, which push the pads against the rotor. This causes friction, which slows the cars down. But there's a few key differences between the brakes on a regular road car and a Formula One car. For example, your road car probably, hopefully, has ABS to make sure that you don't lock up the front tires. This is obviously safer and also allows for better braking performance, especially in slick conditions, because rotating tires will always stop faster than tires that are just skidding along the pavement. And you also have servo-assisted brakes so that you don't have to push so hard on the brake pedal to achieve better braking performance. Formula 1 cars don't have either of these. They don't have ABS, and they also don't have servo-assisted brakes. What this means is that Formula 1 drivers need to push the brake pedal with everything they have and actually use the inertia of their own body during deceleration to be able to get maximum braking. In short, you can't skip leg day. Of course, you have really high temperature brake fluid so that the fluid doesn't boil during a race. You have huge brake calipers with six pistons each for maximum force. The calipers will also be mounted more towards the bottom of the brake rotor for a lower center of gravity. And the pads and rotors themselves are made out of a material called carbon carbon for heat resistance and durability. Typically, brake rotors are made out of cast iron. And cast iron is a really good choice for brakes for the same reason that your skillet is made out of cast iron. It's a very good conductor of heat. And it likes to hold on to that heat for a long time, which keeps your brakes in their operating window for most of your commute. You don't have to warm up your brakes on your way to work Monday morning. They just work. Cast iron is also cheap and easy to make, but for a high performance road car or a race car, for example, you need something that can withstand much higher peak temperatures and also be able to dissipate that heat a lot quicker. This makes cast iron a bad choice for race cars because they like to hold on to heat. This is why you typically see something like carbon ceramic brakes on really high performance cars. These are made from a composite material consisting of carbon fiber fibers embedded in a ceramic matrix. But carbon-carbon brakes are purely carbon-based and are designed for the most demanding braking environments where exceptional performance, heat resistance, and weight savings is required. And we have the Concorde to thank for them. You see, during the Concorde's development, weight savings was the absolute highest priority, and according to a paper written by Dunlop engineers working on the project, the use of carbon-carbon instead of steel saved over 1,300 pounds alone just in the brakes. These revolutionary full carbon brakes with their lightweight design, high durability, and high heat resistance would soon make their way to Formula 1, and by the end of the 70s, they were ubiquitous across the sport, and it remains that way today. So how fast can these cars decelerate exactly? Just how powerful are the brakes in a Formula 1 car, and how close to the limits are we? Well, there's two components to this, and it's the second one that really matters here. First, we need to look at this from a mechanical perspective. Could we theoretically, if we had infinite money, make a Formula 1 car that brakes even faster 
faster than the current cars already do? The answer is yes. On a track like Montreal and Canada, a track that's notoriously hard on the brakes due to its big braking zones with not a lot of space in between for adequate cooling between them, it isn't uncommon for the brakes on Formula 1 cars to get over 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. That's over a thousand degrees Celsius. The reason the brakes get so hot is because there's a tremendous amount of energy in a Formula 1 car that's going 220 miles an hour. We can calculate exactly how much using this equation, where M is the mass of the car in kilograms, V is the velocity in meters per second, and Ke is the kinetic energy in joules. So we have a mass of 970 kilograms, the weight of a Formula 1 car with a full fuel load, plus a 70 kilogram max for Stappen, and a velocity of just over 98 meters per second. If we square the velocity, multiply by the mass, and then divide by 2, we get 4,657,000 and change joules, over 4.6 megajoules of energy. That's a lot of energy, and almost all of it needs to be transferred to heat in a very, very short amount of time, and not into that much material. Of course, some of the energy needed for braking goes into recharging the hybrid battery that modern Formula One cars use, and engine braking also plays a role in slowing the cars down, but most of that energy goes into these carbon-carbon discs that aren't all that much bigger than the brakes on my GTI. In fact, something that I found out when I was researching for this video is that a Formula One car, when it's going at full speed and the driver just lets off the gas, doesn't even touch the brakes, he just lets off the gas, the drag from the downforce that's being generated as well as the engine braking is so intense that the car will decelerate without touching the brakes, the car will decelerate faster than a Porsche 911 doing a full panic stop, which is mind melting to me. And on top of having brake components that have to be capable of withstanding over 4 megajoules of energy over and over again multiple times a minute for hours on end, without this intense downforce that the cars generate at speed, there's no way you would be able to apply full braking or anything close to it without the tires locking up. You need all of that downforce pushing the car into the ground, squeezing that tire against the ground, otherwise you wouldn't have enough grip and you would just lock up instantly. This is why Formula 1 drivers typically apply full brakes at the beginning of the braking zone, but as the speed decreases and the downforce decreases, increases along with it, so they have to ease off to prevent locking up. So the brakes in modern Formula 1 cars are limited by how much downforce the car is able to generate and how much grip the tires have, not so much in the capabilities of the braking components themselves. So if we go back to our imaginary scenario where we have infinite money and we're trying to create the quickest decelerating vehicle on the planet, there would be nothing stopping us from getting a Formula 1 car, throwing some super big wheels and tires on it with some super big, even more powerful brakes, throwing in some ABS to prevent lockups, throwing in some servo assistance to make it easier to push the pedal, and stopping even faster than Formula 1 cars already do. In the current regulations, Formula 1 cars really do decelerate as quickly as possible. But like I said, that's only part of the equation. Sure, we can make a car that theoretically can stop faster than a Formula 1 car can, but who could drive it? As I said earlier, the drivers in Formula 1 cars are subjected to over 6 Gs of deceleration force under full braking. 6 Gs. Show us your teeth. Breathe. That means that your head gets six times as heavy, and you need to be able to hold it up during braking. Not only to be able to see where you're going, obviously, but you don't want to break your neck. But just how much is 6 Gs really? Well, if the average human head, we're getting a little weird here, if the average human head weighs 10 or 11 pounds, that means that your neck needs to be able to support over 60 pounds to keep your head upright during braking. This is no small feat, as I will try to demonstrate. It is an entirely different day. Thanks, Amazon. All right. Here I have 50 pounds, two 25 pound plates. Get out of here, dude. Let's just see if I can pick up 25 pounds. Oh yeah. Oh, this is an easy. Oh man. Oh. All right, that's only 25 pounds. And it's not easy. What about 50? Let's load them up. Oh, no way. Oh, there's no way. Oh, man. Yeah, I'm gonna hurt myself doing that. Oh, boy. This is insane. So my thinking here is I'm trying to simulate what it would be like if my... <laughs> I'm trying to simulate what it would be like if my head was 50 pounds instead of 10 pounds. If I was experiencing 5 Gs of deceleration and I had to try and hold my head up. That's kind of what I'm going for here. And I've got to be honest. 
it's almost impossible. This isn't even including the weight of the helmet, I just noticed. That's why it's almost impossible to break from 200 to zero in less than 30 seconds. Thanks for watching, I'll see you on the next one.